Hi, welcome. We're at Citrus Grove Church. We meet in Pinecrest Academy in the cafeteria here. But Sundays at 9.30, we transform the place and we gather around God's word as his family, as his church. And you're invited. If you're in Wesley Chapel or in the area, Zephyr Hills, Pasco County, come on over. Sundays, 9.30, that's the best place to find out about us and watch how we worship and what uh, our, what we uh, value. You can learn more about us at our website, citrusgrovechurch.com. I'm glad you found this uh, video here on YouTube. You can reach out to me personally. My contact information is alongside this video. Uh, there's some music there, a link to give an offering. There's a, a sign up for our once a week um, email that goes out with all of our ministries, gather, grow, give, and go. And uh, <clears throat> I invite you to be be uh, a follower of our Facebook page as well. That's where you'll see pictures and uh, the latest outreach events we've had going. Um, but if you're at all curious or interested, come join us on a Sunday and uh, introduce yourself and we'll greet you out at the parking lot. Yeah, even if it's raining like it is right now. Well, we're working our way through a Bible book right now, Luke, and we're in chapter 6. And so if you go to the very end of Luke chapter 6, whether on an online Bible like Bible Gateway or You've um, got one there at home. You can follow along there. I'm going to read this section of the, the Bible to you, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Of course, you can't really interact so much on a uh, format like this uh, or on Sunday at worship, so a Bible study time is important as well, where you can ask your questions or give feedback or uh, try to clarify something that I didn't say very well. Um, so that's important as well. We do offer online Bible studies and in-person Bible studies. So um, we'll have an option that will work for you and a chance for some interaction and faith-building time together. So it's not just uh, me telling you what to believe. This is God's word speaking to you, and his spirit does his work through it. So let's pray to him. Dear Holy Spirit, bless our time together around your word and increase our faith in Jesus. Give us a sure and certain foundation that carries us through life and into eternity. Amen. Here's Luke 6, starting at verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. And that's God's word. That's the end of chapter 6, and we'll pick it up at chapter 7 next week. I've got some uh, devotional ideas for this one. Maybe as you heard that those verses, there's one line in there that sticks out more to you. I wish I could read your mind and know which part you'd like to focus in on, but Jesus is, is teaching his followers, teaching believers here. So there's a lot of good application to the lives of Christians here. Um, if you have a question that I don't get to, send me an email or shoot me a text and I'll get back to you. There's a difference between what they call the natural world and the built world. The built world is when you walk around a city and you notice anything that's been constructed, that an engineer has designed, that construction workers put out there. And as you go out to the edge of a city and even out past the suburbs, you'll start to notice more of the natural world. Even, even in a city, a lot of the uh, trees and flowers are kind of part of the built world. They were put there on purpose and they were designed to be exactly like that. You have to get out a ways until you're out in the natural world. We've got some of each of that in these verses from Luke, don't we? We've got some of the natural world of the trees and the briars and the grapes. We've got some of the built world. We've got a house uh, construction project going on here. 
And uh, both of them are interesting, but Jesus is kind of, there's a break in the middle, maybe you heard. He's, he's talking maybe to two different groups of people, um, maybe uh, addressing different questions that people are tossing out to him, and certainly getting to things that are on his mind, that he wants to prepare his followers uh, to think about. Even after he rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, he wants them to think back on this and set it as part of their guidelines, their pattern for a living as his followers in this world. The first universal truth he gets to here is, uh, is about those trees. Is a tree good? Is a tree bad? And he's, he's trying to set out this, this universal truth that your mouth will speak what your heart is full of. If the inside of the tree is rotten, why would you expect good fruit to come from it? If it doesn't have good soil, it's not going to have good fruit. Is it a good tree or a bad tree? And we talk in much the same ways. Maybe we phrase it in, in different ways. We sometimes rephrase as uh, garbage in, garbage out. But, you know, that could be adjusted to match anything. Uh, Jesus in, Jesus out. Greed in, greed out. Violence in, violence out. But peace in, peace out. Um, Let's be very clear up front here uh, so that no one gets mixed up. Positive thinking is not the whole point of this. Positive thinking is probably likely to make you a more positive person. Just like negative thinking is probably going to make you a more negative person. That's true. But positive thinking and being a positive person is not the basis on which God permits souls into his heaven. And neither is how good your fruit, the fruit that you bear through your life, through your words. That is not why God saves. It's not why God forgives. He's not talking at all here about how you're saved, uh, how you're forgiven, how you gain peace with God, how you gain access to heaven. Jesus answers those questions in plenty of words in other passages. And beyond talking about it, he, his desire to save wells up in him and it overflows into action not long after this as he gives up his life, as he dies on the cross and he, God's will to forgive you bubbles up resulting in the death of Jesus Christ, his son. Now, Jesus' blood purifies us from all our sins. His resurrection from the dead raises up all who believe in him, to live with him forever, that good fruit that Jesus bore 100% of the time, that is the reason you'll be in heaven. That is the reason you're forgiven. Jesus' pure heart led to his pure words and actions. What he's talking about in these verses in Luke 6 is how can anyone recognize that you follow a holy Savior? I mean, even before you get a chance to tell them, they're reading you like a book and trying to figure you out, just like you do, right? You're looking at people and you're trying to read them out and figure out what makes them tick. And in general, it, it can be pretty obvious. Now, this is different than being able to see into hearts. And that's the tension that Jesus is bringing up here. Uh, uh, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Is, uh, is God chose King David long ago, even though his brothers looked far more physically impressive and they were older. You'd think he would have chosen one of them. No, God told his prophet to anoint little David because God was looking in the heart and he was choosing this guy, not that guy. He can see the heart and you can't. Nobody can. Nobody can see into your heart and truly know what are you thinking. You could be fooling everyone for all they know. I could be fooling you for all anyone knows. We have to just remember that. I can't read hearts. The Lord, when we say only God can judge, we're, we're kind of leaving that to him. We're saying, as far as I can see, uh, this is how this person acts, this is how they talk, this is how they live, I, and this is what they say they believe. I can't, I can't do any more than that. We can look at fruits. We can listen to their words, we can watch their actions, and we can make a guess about what makes a person tick. And you kind of have to, to function in society. You're always kind of guessing and almost uh, trusting that what you see a person showing you is what they truly value and believe. Uh, and it's not just Christians. Everyone can uh, universally can recognize a, a person's fruit. What your heart is full of 
overflows out of your mouth, out of your hands, out of your calendar, out of your bank account. It all reflects your priorities. Even what you uh, type out for others to see online. Think about that example. And you know, if you're not a very online person, you just have enough to get to this website and, and watch this video, okay, just, you know, just bear with me here. But for the rest of you, if you're scrolling someone's timeline, you're scrolling the timeline, and you see an interesting post, and you go, oh, that's interesting. And then you can usually share it onto your own personal timeline for all of your friends to see what you just read or saw. Maybe you thought it was funny. Maybe you thought it was interesting. Maybe you thought it, was, it made you angry, whatever. But that is acting out this verse. It's showing all of your followers what you are filling up your heart with on your own timeline that you're, that you're consuming. And it's so much that you've, you've consumed this over here, what the algorithm behind Facebook or Twitter, whatever, was showing you. you. You feasted on that. And now you're overflowing with it, and you just have to share it out for them to see too, and react to, and like, or get angry about. It can be anything. It can be good or bad. It can be healthy or unhealthy. But what you're displaying to others is definitely a reflection of what you're consuming. And that's why the Spirit inspired countless verses like, uh, for example, F Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is not why you get into heaven. But this is consuming what God would have you consume so that you display what God would have you display. And you will be recognized. You'll be recognized by people who watch you and ask the question. Uh, maybe they're always asking this question, even if they don't verbalize it. The question is, why would I want to be like those Christians? I got their invitation at this 4th of July event. I saw their flags when I was driving by Highway 54. I... I got their invitation, I saw their online ad, whatever. I, I know they're there. I know they're inviting me. I know they want to be there. Maybe I even got a, a verbal, a personal invitation from a friend. Come with me to my church, because I know you don't have a church. You should come with me to my church and just see. And their response will be, why would I want to be like that Christian? And maybe they have a pretty good answer, because they've watched you handle a death in the family and understood that you grieved but you grieved like someone with hope and there's their answer I want hope like that when someone in my family dies or maybe they've watched you grumble about money over and over like you're never at peace like nothing will ever be enough like uh, you haven't been given enough to survive and like God hasn't been very good to you and they notice that too. Or they say, why would I want to be like that? They'll say it. And that's what Jesus is knowing. That's, the key word in here is recognize. That by their fruit, you will recognize what's in your heart. And people recognize what's in your heart too. Now, I, uh, um, I'm cut to the heart when I see a verse like, no good tree bears good fruit. You know, you think, I've, I've done plenty. <laughs> that is not very good fruit. And in, in general, in the universal truth that Jesus is teaching here, yeah, good trees will bear good fruit, but I've sure got a rotten part in me, and I know you do too. That is uh, pretty quick to bear bad fruit and would be recognized by people from the outside as, ugh, why would I want to be like that? If that's what being a Christian is, why would I want to be like that? And so... We apologize to the Lord for misrepresenting him, uh, for misleading people around us into thinking that uh, this is what being a Christian is. When we haven't given a very good witness, that's, uh, that's detrimental not only to ourselves, but also to a person we love, a person we care about, and we want to be a Christian along with us. What we need is forgiveness from him for that. And what we need is transformation of that part of us that is rotten, into something that is better, something that is healthy. A heart that is healthy and bears good fruit is the reason Citrus Grove Church exists. 
And so let's keep, let's keep reading and, and keep uh, glancing through these verses because God does provide that. I mean, the, the first half of this section is about a tree that is also bearing good fruit. Like, they do exist. And if there, if, there were, if there were only Jesus as the only pure person who's ever lived, well, there's, there's, there's got to be some other way of getting to be a good tree, of having a healthy heart. And there is. Otherwise, we'd all be in the, the bad tree pile and uh, we'd all be fit to be chopped down and, and thrown into the fire. But God transforms us. He provides a way in his mercy that bad trees can the next day be a healthy tree. Um, and it, it, ha- it does have to do with when you were founded, when you were established. And, and that kind of hints at the next section here where there's a, a house that is built on a foundation. Think about when you were founded, when you were established. I'm not saying uh, birth or conception. I'm saying when you were founded as a a Christian. Uh, Think about a company that puts an ESTD date, established date. You know, and why do they do that? What do you care about what year they were established? Maybe if they say uh, established 1973. Maybe they're trying to throw you back to the 70s and think, oh, they're, they've got a cool, surfy vibe. Or maybe a, if a tech company says, we were, we were established back in the 90s. Maybe they're trying to prove to you that even with all the changes in technology from the 90s, they're still, a, 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 they're still around and they're ahead of the game. They're, they're able to weather changes and, and stay ahead of everything. Maybe if they say, uh, we're a jeans company from 1892 or whatever. They're, they're trying to sh- throw you back to this bygone era when things had quality and it was made right here in America or something. You, you just, you, quality you just don't see anymore. And they're saying we were established way back then. And they let you make the jump mentally. They were founded on this date and it tells you how the company is going to act now. Now maybe they don't, but maybe just, it's a shorthand way of putting the established date on there And you, the the buyer, are going to think certain things about them when you see that established date. So when was your established date? When were you founded? You could say your baptism. That's a good answer. It's when Jesus brought you into his family and put his name on you and said, Oh, all right, you you carry me around. He washed your, your sins clean so that you, in his eyes, are a good tree. And he sends you off to bear good fruit. You are capable of that, thanks to his spirit living in you. From bad tree to good tree, in one act of mercy from God, the baptism that brings you to faith. Or you could say even farther back. My faith was founded in those earliest years A.D., founded in a stable, developed in the mountains and plains of Israel, the lakes and villages over there. And it really reached its peak. Its, its foundation was laid on a Friday afternoon when the sky went dark and on a Sunday morning when angels sat next to an empty tomb. That was when my faith was founded. That'd be a, a good answer. That's a way, to, a way to think about your established date and the foundation on which you build. Nothing would be possible. There'd be nothing you could hope for if, uh, if you didn't have that. And so because your established date is built way back then, well, now you, you always kind of look back on that. And that is your vibe, the vibe from when your faith was founded. There's just one other aspect of these verses I want you to think about today, and that's this question of, of uh, is it fixed? This question of, of whether a tree is good or bad, um, you know, it sounds so fixed, like it can't change. But like we're talking about it, it has. It can. Same with the foundation of a house. We haven't talked much about that house, but think about the house. Uh, you can redecorate it as much as you want. You can put different paint on the outside, but nothing you do that way can, can really change whether it was built on rock or sand. If it had, had pilings and foundations just dug in and resting on something solid, or if there was no foundation work done at all, no amount of redecorating is going to change that. I mean, nothing's going to change that without starting completely over. In both of those parables, though, Jesus is urging his followers, like you, he's urging you to avoid the bad, to strive for the good, to do, to act, to live. And he's saying, don't just listen to my words and uh, nod and nod and nod, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Go do it. 
do what I say. Now, can just try harder. Go do it. Can that be enough to change a tree from bad to good? Is that enough to change a foundation from weak to solid? And that's kind of Jesus' whole point. No, it, it can't. A bad tree will still be bearing bad fruit, even if you spend all day shouting at it to produce better fruit. And a, a weak foundation is going to be weak or non-existent, even if you redecorate it all day long. It just can't change what it is. A bad foundation stays bad. A bad tree only produces bad fruit. But what fills up your heart? Whose words are you listening to? That is what makes all the difference. Because Jesus in your heart, Jesus' words of promise, bring about something entirely new. It's called a new creation in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, where where, uh, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself, made peace between God and us. Uh, God, uh, God made peace with himself and us by reconciling us to himself through Christ. A bad tree can never become good, but Jesus can recreate it into a good tree. That's the exception. That's the way around. And then Christ can fill up your innards, like filling up the inside of a tree with certainty and assurance and forgiveness and mercy. And then, well, don't be surprised if your newly created heart starts talking a lot like how Jesus first talked to you. And acting how Jesus first acted toward you and showing mercy like you were first shown mercy. In the same way, the bad foundation on sand is stuck. It cannot improve. But Jesus' words come along, transform that soil, and you come to discover, standing on Jesus, I'm not blown around anymore by tides of change or rivers of uncertainty. You learn, I can trust God on this. And my faith in him is is, is, is worth holding on to. It's worth putting into practice. And we can work on that. We can listen to Jesus then and do and act and live. And we need that encouragement of, of taking what we understand to be true inside to put it into practice. And that is, that is what it is to live like the wise, wise person that I never used to be. To put our faith in Jesus into practice. Beautiful words from Jesus, good reminders, uh, encouragements for us to stick with it, that you are doing a wise thing by building on Jesus, that you can always do a better thing by living according to his words, by bearing good fruit that is pleasing to him and benefits someone else around you. You need reassurance. You need to feast on his words, and you need the the guidance to put it into practice. This is something we can't do on our own. So Jesus provides family, friends, and a church to encourage you in it. God bless you this week as you stand on that foundation of Jesus and bear good fruit to his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.